Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today, we're doing an early impression on a grail frag fragrance, or what many would consider to be a grail fragrance. And it is from the house of Jean Patou. Uh, it came out in 1994, and it's called Patou Porom Privé. Now, um, this is the Privé version, not the original Patou Pour Homme, which the original came out in 1980, which I have right here. Uh, the Privé version came out in 1994. And the way that I acquired a couple drops of this precious juice is actually uh, a couple years ago when I purchased Derby uh, from a friend. Um, he said, hey man, my favorite fragrance is Patou Pour Homme Privé. Have you ever smelled it? And I said, nope. And he said, okay, cool. I'll throw in a mill or I'll throw in like one mill for you because it's very precious and rare juice. And I said, great, throw it in there. And he did, he threw it in. And as is my habit when I, you know, get stuff in that uh, I plan on smelling in the future, I threw it away. I, well, I didn't throw it away. I threw it into my, you know, bag of samples that have been sitting there for years. And today, I uh, decided to pull it out, and I went, you know what? Um, I have been letting this sit here for years. I bet you it actually gave me more than... I bet you it's been evaporating over the years. Let me use this precious juice in this shitty little sample. Um, and so here you go. Patou Pour Homme Privé video at, at work. Um, now, uh, this fragrance, I will tell you just right off of the bat. Um, this fragrance is different from the original in many ways, and we'll talk about it. This isn't going to necessarily be a comparison, but we will talk about some of the differences. Um, and the price of this fragrance is also worth mentioning right out of the gate, right up front. Because if you go to eBay right now and look for a bottle of Patou Pour Homme Privé, you're, you're probably looking somewhere in the neighborhood of one to $2,000. Yes, one to $2,000. Um, and this is a fougere construction. It's built by Jean Carlio, and I'll explain to you why most of his fragrances are now insane prices. Um, but let's go through the scent. Let's, let's walk through it because uh, I've had this on my skin now for a couple hours. So again, this is like an early impression, but I have enough of the scent to at least give you what it feels like to me so far, okay? Um, and so when you first spray, you get a heavy hit of lavender, very heavy hit of lavender, um, top with a slight anise touch. So when you first spray the first five or 10 seconds, you're going to smell an anise like note. And then, uh, you begin to get bits of, uh, pissy, what maybe smells like cassis or, um, pissy petit gras, neroli combo, something like that. Uh, and, um, don't let that pissy comment scare you though. This is very elegantly balanced. This is one of, you know, this is one of the, uh, elegant masculine fragrances of the past that, you know, people who, uh, love vintage perfumes go crazy over. Uh, and this is a, I mean, this is a, if you were going to like a ball, you know, if you were going to a, um, black tie dinner or something like that. This this is the kind of scent that you wear. I mean, this is a CEO scent. I'm always I always say things like Derby, Guerlain's Darby is a CEO scent. Patou Pour Homme is a CEO scent. So is uh Patou Pour Homme Privé, but it goes about it in a different manner, okay? You know, it's 14 years after Patou Pour Homme. They came out with the Privé version. Uh long time. You see the uh, timelines that these houses worked on back then were a completely different world, maybe a different universe. Now these houses are releasing flankers two, three times a year. Um, you know, one year they'll release a fragrance, the next year they'll release the Eau de Parfum, the next year they'll release the extra, you know, the extra intense, the extra double intense, uh, triple uh, Eau de Parfum, you know, in, yeah, all this crazy stuff. And, um, it gets a little old when these houses do it. And so when you see the timeline, now obviously he wasn't working on this for 14 years, but when you see the timeline and, and the, the houses and the, and the perfumers who could take their time back then, they didn't have a weekend. You know, there's a famous story um, that Anne Gottlieb forced one of the 
um, well-known perfumers who had hits. I mean, she wasn't a nobody, but Ann Gottlieb forced her to redo a scent over the weekend and get it back to her on Monday. Um, those kind of timelines, that didn't exist back then. You know, not when fragrance houses had sometimes over a decade between releases. Um, and so you get this beautiful lavender, absolutely gorgeous lavender, right? When you first spray and, um, nothing is ever seen in a Jean Carlio creation. Nothing is ever overdosed or underdosed. Everything is always perfectly balanced. He is one of the greatest perfumers of all time, in my opinion. And he loves the classics. He loves classically uh, proper uh, structures. He loves classically Fre he loves classical French perfumery. Um, and he has a very deft hand. Okay, so when I when I say that there's a little bit of pissy cassia cassis, um, maybe it's some some uh, bitter petit gras, which those notes aren't listed. This is what my nose smells in the opening with lavender. And, you know, a very deft hand with bergamot, okay? So classic bergamot-lavender combination in the top. And um, you'll begin to smell, maybe I would even say, um, you'd begin to smell the beautiful Mysore sandalwood that you smell in the original Patu Porom, probably as early as 15 minutes into the scent. You can begin to pick it up, okay? And Mysore sandalwood, most people, Mysore sandalwood has become this, you know, mythical ingredient in people's mind. They think, oh, it's Mysore sandalwood. It's going to be a beast. It's going to be, everyone's going to smell me. No, that's not how Mysore sandalwood works. Mysore sandalwood is just one type of many sandalwoods. And um, to be honest, it's very soft and smooth and buttery, very elegant, okay? It's a very relaxing scent for me too. You know, it really calms me down. Um, if I smell Mysore sandalwood or just sandalwood in general, I would say, if I smell sandalwood, I mean, it literally feels like your heart slows down a little bit. You know, you've taken a deep breath, you're relaxed, like you've had a hot bath. It's that kind of vibe, right? And you will get the Mysore sandalwood here. Absolutely. And, you know, that Mysore sandalwood is the main reason that vintage hunters go crazy for um, Jean Carlio's work is basically what it comes down to. The Mysore sandalwood shows up early and it stays late in the scent, okay? Uh, and since, my, since Jean Carlio loved to use heavy oak moss, which I don't think there's much oak moss in this composition, if any, uh, there might be some, but not much. Um, I think it's more about the lavender, sandalwood, and a couple other notes, which we'll talk about in just a second. But just keep this in mind. The Mysore sandalwood joins the party early, and it stays late, okay? So at least for the time that it's been on my skin, I've been able to smell it now. Almost five or ten minutes, definitely at the 15-minute mark in, and then you can continue to smell it. And it's a beautiful sandalwood. You know, you can tell he used some of the highest quality ingredients back then. Yeah, it's just absolutely stunning. Um, traditionally masculine to a T. And um, if you compare... So, really quick, before we do the comparison with Patu Poro, um, you know, if you... If you think about uh, the time... Okay, that this came out. So Jean Carlio is in-house perfumer of Patu forever. Okay, he's he's been there what seems like since the 50s at that point. I don't think he's been there that long, but he was in at Patu for him forever. He was at Patu, Jean Patu forever and ever and ever. And he released Patu Porom in, in 1980. This came out in 94. So think about the landscape in the early 90s. Things were changing. Uh, was Patu going to put out a blue fragrance, uh, a marine fragrance like everyone else? Absolutely not. They ended up doing it later in the decade because um, I think the, the company was, uh, is it Charisse? I can't remember the name. Um, but they basically told him, listen, you're the in-house perfumer. We are demanding that you create us a blue scent. He didn't want to. I mean, he was not happy about it, okay? Uh, and so they put this out like one year before Aqua de Jo. They put this out 
um, what was it, 87 that Cool Water came out. So this is a full seven years after Cool Water, and they're putting out something like this. Uh, it's very classical. Uh, you know, this is, this. I think of uh, the people who didn't want to ride the Blue Wave buying stuff like this back in the 90s, okay? And um, so when you think about the comparison to Patu Porom, um, there are noticeably different notes going on. So obviously I mentioned the Mysore Sandalwood. Um, but there's a, a note of patchouli that's in Patu Porom Privé that is missing in, um, that is missing in, in just the original Patu Porom. There's no patchouli, okay? And if you think of, um, a couple hits from the early 90s that are in this category, okay? And there were a few. Uh, one was uh, one of my favorite fragrances of all time, Heritage by the House of Guerlain. This has a rock star patchouli note in it. Um, and another is a fragrance that came out, I think a year or two before uh, Heritage in, in 1992. Uh, this other fragrance is a fragrance called Ungaro Porlom One. Now this is the hardest one to find of all three. You can tell the bottle's a little beat up. There's no cap. I don't care. I'm just so happy to have this fragrance, and I do love it. Um, and, you know, both of those have this patchouli. And the patchouli in both of them uh, will remind you a little bit of the way that the patchouli is used in Patu Porom Privé. Okay, now there's a couple other notes that all kind of blend together to give the whole vibe of the scent. One is the note of hay, okay? And the other is the note of vanilla. And so we're talking patchouli, we're talking vanilla. If you're kind of already a couple steps ahead of me, I think you're kind of getting the idea with, with you know, the Guerlainade, but I'll get there. So um, I will say though, before we kind of go into that, is the hay note in this. Most of the time when I think about hay, uh, or when I talk about hay, I usually say it has this tobacco-like vibe. You know, um, there is a uh, woman perfumer out of England, um, Liz Moores, who I did an interview with. Go watch it if you haven't watched it yet. She is absolutely stunning as a creator. And um, she made a fragrance called Tobacco Rose, and she used no tobacco in it. What she used was hay, because hay has that dry, crinkly, it'll give you, like, tobacco vibes. For some reason... The hay here, to my nose, really smells like hay. Um, yeah, I mean, it really has this... It has this... Um, uh, it has this distinct hay-like vibe, almost like you've taken hay and squeezed, like, some citruses on, some bergamot, some lemon, you know, that kind of vibe. That's what the hay smells like while still remaining, like, crinkly and dry. It's a strange contrast, but it works, and it's absolutely stunning. And then, um, that patchouli, and the patchouli is also absolutely stunning. The patchouli used in these late 80s, early 90s fragrances are some of my favorite patchoulis of all time. I mean, you've got stuff like Balenciaga Pour Homme, you've got Amen, um, you've got uh, Zeno, that was an amazing patchouli uh, fragrance. Um... Just all kinds of stuff. YSL Jazz had an amazing patchouli note. I mean, so many fragrances from the late 80s, early 90s had it. And apparently, so did Patu Pour Homme Privé. And uh, what ends up happening is the hay gives the patchouli this dry, you know, bone dry feel where the notes are so well separated um, where it almost feels like you can smell, in your mind, you can envision what the patchouli, uh, would smell like if there wasn't that dry, hay-like note. And I think if you just pick that patchouli note out on its own, it would be quite green, quite herbal, quite green. Um, but because there is that dry, hay, bone-dry, hay-like note, it really... Uh, blends with the patchouli to create the smell that you're getting. And then the final note in the composition is the depth that vanilla adds. And the vanilla, um, you know, if if you blindfolded me 
and put Patu Porum Privé in front of me and said, who made this? I would probably say Jean-Paul Guerlain. I would probably say this is a Guerlain. And the reason that I would say that is because uh, of the base. If the base of this fragrance feels like it's made of a Guerlainade, like it has that Guerlainade uh, DNA. Now, it also has one other um, link to a Guerlain that uh, is the reason why if I was blindfolded before I knew all this, I would say Jean-Paul Guerlain created this because the opening, remember I said it had that pissy, bergamot, um, lavender, petit gran, neroli, pissy, cassis-like smell? It reminded me of the opening in this, Coriolan by Guerlain. This was an absolute flop. It came out four years, four or five years after Patu Pour en Privé. But rumor is Jean-Paul Guerlain was working on this for decades. Like he started working on it when he started working on Derby in the early 80s. And um, I'm curious now that I've had a chance to really give Patu Porom Privé aware. Um, well, I didn't have enough juice to give it a full scent of the day wear, but at least kind of wear it for the last couple hours. Which, by the way, my uh, review today, my scent of the day today was a Louis Vuitton. I've got it right here on my hand and it's called Fleur du Desert. And uh, smelling this against this just shows how um, far perfume has fallen, let's say. And I actually ended up saying I like this. I mean, I didn't like the opening of the Louis Vuitton, uh, but, you know, it does dry into something respectable. But for $365, it should be way more than respectable. Patu Pour Homme Privé absolutely crushes the Louis Vuitton. I mean... It's it's not even a it's not even a contest. You're putting the um, you know champions of the NFL up against a pee wee football team. Uh, it's 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 that stark of a contrast between the two. Uh, and and sometimes after a day of wearing stuff like this, and the only reason I wore it is because I wanted to test it for you guys. Um, I am just so relieved to put some vintage stuff like this on. Oh God, it is so, it's really, really good. Um, and so because it has that pissy citrus opening that reminded me of, of, of Coriolan, I thought it, you know, smelled very much like a Guerlain, especially when you take into account that vanilla Guerlainade in the base, right? And, and by the way, in case you guys didn't know, Jean-Paul Guerlain caught uh, lightning in a bottle with Heritage. This was an absolute hit in the early 90s. This sold like hotcakes. Even though it was a classical composition, it sold like hotcakes. And I think, you know, uh, Jean Carlio in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, was starting to get pressure on him from the owners of, of the house of Jean Patou. They wanted sales, you know, and he was about putting out fine French perfumery in a classical structure that he, you know, he was the perfumer. He was the enforcer of what's right, what's wrong. He was the decider, you know, and um, I think his mindset had to kind of change a little bit because they wanted sales, you know, and so I, I could totally see him putting this out as a compromise to both sides of the aisle. He's thinking, hey, I'm, I'm in the realm of a fragrance that's selling very well, so this should sell very well. And yet, at the same time, I'm creating something very classical, classically structured. This is a well-made fougere. There are, um, the notes are very simple, actually. Bergamot and lavender in the top, sandalwood, patchouli, and hay in the mid, vanilla in the base. That's it. Now, I mentioned a couple notes that I thought I got that aren't listed. I mentioned a slight anise, anisic-like quality aniseed, if you will, um, when you first spray. I mentioned that pissy, cassis, um, neroli, petit gran, you know, almost like crushed bitter orange leaves um, in the opening, which is not listed. And I think there's a floral element to this fragrance too, not listed. So uh, since this is a classic fougere, or it's supposed to be a classic fougere, and you're dealing with Jean Carlio, who wants to stay classically within the lines. You know, he doesn't want to draw outside of those lines. 
My guess is there's probably spicy geranium, which is giving it the spice because there is this spicy quality that I don't know where it's coming from. Um, my store sandalwood can sometimes be a little bit floral, but not as floral as this is going. This is going very floral. Um, so I think he's used spicy geranium, um, which is part of the fougere construction. Basically the skeleton of a fougere, if it's proper fougere, uh, you should have the lavender, uh, you should have the uh, mid of geranium, and you should have the base of uh, tonka, okay? Now there's no tonka listed, and I think that's the final um, kicker, is I think there's tonka in the base, and I think that tonka really helps support the hay, and it helps support the vanilla from being too sweet, because now... You know, if you if you smell modern Tonka today, you think it's sweet. It's not. I actually have the actual Tonka bean that Russian Adam sent me um, in the pure form, and it's not sweet at all. It almost smells. Um, um, it almost smells a little bit almondy. Um, it it smells like maybe you're smelling uh, something that would go along with a hay note. You know, it complements tobacco very well. Um, there's no tobacco in here, but there's hay, which I said can sometimes smell like tobacco. And so I think Jean Cardillo stuck to that proper fougere structure, if you will. Um, and even though there's not those notes listed, I would say I pick them up. That, that would be my guess. Okay, I could be completely wrong. There maybe even is a touch of rose in here. Um, there's maybe a touch of vetiver. There's no vetiver note listed. There is a vetiver listed in the original Patu uh, Porom. As you can see, there is vetiver, Mysore sandalwood, uh, Malabar pepper, clary sage, which clary sage has this um, dry, sweaty like vibe. It could also be clary sage in Patu Porom Privé. <laughs> it could be clary sage in the top. Um, and there's a cedar note listed in. Um, the original Petu Porom, which is not listed here. It's only sandalwood. And there's a pimento note. Uh, but you notice there's no patchouli, there's no hay, there's no vanilla. Um, and so, you know, this smells much more 80s and this smells much more 90s to me. And, um, you know, um, the... What else was I going to mention? Um, oh, yes. I know what I was going to mention. The final thing is, if you like this fragrance, this if you like the way that this sounds, this construction, if you will, I would highly urge you, I would almost beg you, do not go spend $2,000 on a bottle of this unless you are flush, unless you are just a multi-millionaire, you know, You've got 10, 20, 50 million in the bank and spending two grand is like going to get a McDonald's cheeseburger for me. Do not buy this fragrance for $2,000 because Jean Carlio created a fragrance a couple years before Patu Poron Privé in 94. And it was a women's fragrance. And um, it did not get the hype, you know, it did not get the hype that Patu Poron Privé and Patu Poron, the original, got. And the reason they got it is because of the Mysore sandalwood. People thought Mysore sandalwood. Uh, see, Mysore, by the way, has this um, um, Mysore has this buttery quality to it, but it also can sometimes smell slightly musky. Okay, so the fragrance almost feels like it's sitting on a bed of musk, but it's not. It's sitting on the Mysore sandalwood, and um, and that's in both of these, by the way, you get that, you know, slightly buttery, musky quality. Um, and it's very smooth. These are very, I mean, these are absolute gentlemen. You know, if you wear this, which again, I don't have a full bottle of Patu Porum Privé, but let's say you wear this, the original, either or, right? To a, a black tie event, to a reception where there's a lot of people Maybe you're giving a presentation, you're dressed nice, you've got your, you know, crocodile shoes on or whatever it is. You've got your, um, uh, you've got your suede shoes on, I don't know. 
But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna make an impression, absolutely for sure. This is smooth operator, classic gentleman's fragrance. And what ended up happening is the gentleman's fragrances, for whatever reason, the men's fragrances uh, skyrocketed in price. Not just with uh, Pat with the house of Patu. They are not the only one. Many houses vintage masculine fragrances went through the roof. Um, Dunhill Blend 30, through the roof. Old Ted Lapidus Pour Homme, through the roof. Uh, you know, you Guerlain Darby, through the roof. All these old masculines went up like crazy in price. For whatever reason, the women's didn't follow suit. I think it was the men that first realized... Maybe I'm just talking out of my, you know, maybe I'm just talking out of my ear here, but uh, I think it was the men that first realized, hey, wait a minute, uh, these perfumes are not what we expected. I think historically women liked sweeter fragrances, so the change to modern fragrances didn't bother them as much. They just continued to buy modern stuff. But I think many men felt like they missed the power fragrances of the 70s and 80s. They missed the Lagerfeld cologne. Uh, they missed the Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Homme, the Tsar from 1989. You know, they missed Hugo Boss number one, Coros, Antaeus, all the stuff I love, Bella Me. They missed that. And they went back and started to buy it, and prices went crazy, right? But it didn't equate to the women's side yet. But I think that's coming. Because what ended up happening is some of these houses... Um, you know, use some of those same high quality ingredients uh, in both the men's and the women's side. It's not like the women got short sight, short change. No, it's just there used to be more delineated lines of the sexes back then. Men wore men's fragrances. Women wore women's fragrances. A man would never put on a fragrance that didn't say for men or poor home back then, right? Uh, and that's just how it was. I mean, if you handed a, if you handed a man uh, a woman's fragrance, uh, even if you explain to them, like, uh, with, you know, you could, you could explain to them, hey, Akitos was meant to be poison. It competed for the poison brief. It was supposed to be a women's fragrance, and you love it, and you're wearing it. Why don't you try these women's fragrances? They wouldn't, right? Now they are. And what ended up coming out is this. Uh, this is where I'm going with this story, is there's many women fragrances that are still cheap, and still able to be found, and still have the Mysore sandalwood and all that stuff in it for a tenth of the price, a twentieth of the price. So this is a 50 ml bottle of Jean Patou Ma Liberté Eau de Parfum. Now, rumor is that the Eau de Toilette is just as beautiful. Uh, I've never smelled it, okay? But I know Galen loves the Eau de Toilette. And Ma Liberté, um, to me, is a fragrance that has a skeletal structure very similar to uh, Patou Pour Homme Privé, all right? Uh, it has, again, a couple things that are going to be different. Nothing is ever exactly one for one, but again, it's the same perfumer. Uh, it has that citrus, lavender, floral, spice, musk, uh, patchouli, sandalwood combo. It has everything we discussed. It even has some of the things I mentioned that might be in here that aren't. It has vetiver, okay? Vetiver is historically a very traditionally masculine note. It has cedar, which is in Patou Pour Homme, the original from 1980. Uh, and it has a couple other things, okay? Uh, and the other things are heliotrope. Now, the heliotrope adds this... Um, Heliotrope can sometimes come across smelling almost play, almost almondy Play-Doh like, and it also has a texture like Play-Doh to me. So uh, I get very big purple, like like the color purple flashes in my head when I smell heliotrope. Um, and um, oh man, I would love to have a bottle of this, but there's no way in hell I am paying two grand for a bottle of this. So uh, this, my liberté can be had 50 mils, 100 bucks. At least I got this for 78, 80 bucks a couple years ago. I'm guessing you can still find them for 100, 150. Um, even if it's 200, let's just say it's 200, which I think you can probably get a 100 ml bottle for 200 bucks now. But 
let's just say it's um, 200. This is 1,000 to 2,000 for a bottle. This is an absolute steal because I think he used this as the DNA. I mean, uh, you can see the Jean Patou logo. It smells divine. Um, it has many masculine notes. It also has a note of clove, by the way. So it's got clove. Um, it's got heliotrope and citrus fruits in the top, which smells like probably some sort of bergamot and lemon. Um, and then it's got clove, jasmine, lavender, rose, which I mentioned the geranium, which can smell like rose and patou, pour en privé. I think there's geranium in there. And then it's got musk, which the sandalwood, I said, smells musky. So you're getting the idea. It has that DNA. Now the heliotrope and the clove uh, and the addition of much more cinnamon. There's no cinnamon here. I don't think there's a drop of cinnamon in Patou Pour en Privé. There is cinnamon in here. And that makes it a little thicker and a little heavier. Okay. Uh, but I absolutely love this stuff. I think that this is an absolute masterpiece gem. Um, there, there are some houses that I've discovered along the way. Like, for example, the house of Kritzia. Uh, one of my favorite fragrances from that house, and they have many, but one of my favorites is Tietro Alla Scala. That's a woman's targeted fragrance. The original Coco by Chanel. That's one of my favorite Chanel's. You know, it's not, Antaeus is still my favorite, I think, but, and Queer de Russie. Um, but it's up there. I mean, it's one of my favorites from the house. This is one of my favorites from the house of Jean Patou. Do I love Patou Pour Homme? Yes. Do I love the Privé? Yes. But damn it, this competes right up there. And with value for money being so important nowadays, if we're going to go into a recession, times are going to get tough, people are going to lose their jobs, whatever it is, you know, the economy's struggling, um, and you still want to experience amazing perfume from the past, but you don't want to spend two grand, here you go. Here's your answer. I mean, it's right here. I'm giving it to you. Um, just go pull the trigger. Thank me later. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm that confident about it. Uh, this is woody, spicy. This would probably be considered masculine today. I mean, I know they marketed it for women in 87, but I think today this would be masculine. Um, so how's that for a first impression, early impression of Patou Pour Homme Privé? I would love a bottle of this. If anyone wants to sell me a bottle for 100, 200 bucks, Write me. I'm all over it. But there's no way in hell I would ever pay a thousand or two thousand bucks. So thank you for watching. Do let me know your comments if you have any experience with Patou Pour Homme Privé from 94 or the House of Jean Patou. Appreciate the comments and feedback and I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Cheers guys.